Lifting Up Jesus, opening his word from Australia, Denmark, Israel, Japan, New Zealand, Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland, Singapore, South Africa, United Kingdom, Thailand, the Philippines, the United States, and throughout the world. You're watching L'Oreal TV. Jacob, one of the believers asked, who is the Council of Hippo, and what was their role in constructing the canon? What we call the Council of Hippo was actually not a council per se, but what was known as a synod. The complication is, from the year 393 to the year 426, there was perhaps a half dozen of them. Not all of them attended by Augustine. Not all of them. They did agree on the canon of scripture. However, it was not the first synod or the first council doing that. Neither was it the last. The first dealt with the Old Testament, and it was the Council of Yavne around 90 AD, near the modern city of Tel Aviv, um, convened by Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, who rejected the messiahship of Jesus. He was the classmate of St. Paul. They simply affirmed what had been held in Judaism before the destruction of the temple to be the canonical scriptures. So the Old Testament, that 70% of the scripture, was affirmed before the advent of any Christian agreement by any council of synod on what was canonical. What was important about Hippo, or Re Regius Hippo, the synods, was that they established the criteria for canonicity. The criteria for canonicity had to be something called clerical continuum and apostolic credence. In other words, it had to be what the apostles held to be the Word of God inspired as Scripture. It had to be of apostolic authorship or something the apostles asserted was divinely inspired. They established the criteria at these synods at Hippo. The final canon came into play in Nicaea, the time of the Emperor Constantine that was politically motivated. Now, what became the Roman Catholic canon originally? The void of the deuterocanonical books, that is the Apocrypha, without them, were agreed at these synods that took place at Hippo. The Eastern Orthodox texts were slightly different, and they were agreed jointly later on in um, the Council of Nicaea, again, driven by Constantine's desire to maintain the unity in the church because he saw it as a way to maintain a unity in a crumbling or dividing, fragmenting Roman Empire. The problem that the Roman Catholic Church has with these synods of Hippo is this. They did not originally consider the apocryphal books to be canonical. That did not come until a much, much later point, well after the year 1000 AD. Only when we got into the earlier days of the Renaissance did this become prolific in Roman Catholicism where they had to consider these books to be canonical. As we've said before, 1st and 2nd Maccabees and 1st and 2nd Enoch are scripturally important history and literature, but they are not a basis of doctrine. They are not canonical in the sense they are not a basis of doctrine in and of themselves, even though they are historically important as literature in understanding doctrine. There was no verse that taught purgatory, but there is a verse in Maccabees that says it's good to pray for the dead. Now, in the original Jewish context, that would have been so the Messiah would come and make it a way for the souls in the bosom of Abraham to come to the place of eternal blessing, eternal life. They were in the bosom of Abraham waiting for the Messiah. That's what it would have meant and could, would have been understood as by the early believers. But the Roman Catholic Church needed a way to, to market indulgences, to sell indulgences, and to get people to pay for getting their mother or their grandmother or whatever, or their parents out of purgatory. So it's good to pray for the dead was the only verse they had, except that was not canonical, so they made the Apocrypha canonical. 
But the synods of Hippo show the hypocrisy of the Roman Catholic philosophy of canonicity. They themselves originally did not consider these books to be canonical in the apostolic sense. That is the difference. The second difference is the Eastern Orthodox canon and the Latin canon are different. The Latin canon came to be Jerome's uh, Vulgate, the Vulgate of, of, of Jerome in the West. But to this day, the Eastern Orthodox Old Testament is the Septuagint, is the Septuagint, not the Masoretic. You have this fragmentation between the Latin West and the Greek-speaking East. This had tremendous social, cultural, and political problems. Going back to the book of Daniel, the two legs of the statue image that Daniel saw trying to hold the Roman Empire together. Constantine was keen to use Christianity as a means to hold this together. What do you do when you have a Latin church? What do you do when you have a Greek church, when you have to hold them together? This was the impetus for what happened at the Council of uh, Nicaea at a later point. Uh, they were also trying to affirm other things that, that were good and true, but such as the uh, Trinitarian doctrines of Anastasius and so forth against heretics denying one God and three persons. But although they said true things, so did Yavne say true things. But this did not mean that the origin of those true things were with them. What Yohanan ben Zakkai affirmed to be the Hebrew canon was already practically established in the understanding of everyone. Jesus referred to the law, the prophets, and the Psalms, the Tanakh, the Ketuvim, Torah, Nevim, Ketuvim, the Tanakh, the law, he spoke of the law and the prophets and the Psalms, the Psalms being the chief literature of the Ketuvim. The Hebrew canon breaks the Old Testament down by literary genre, Torah, Nevim, Katuvim, and Jesus made reference to that. It was already well established, even though there was some kind of an official confirmation of it or affirmation of it legally, uh, or within Jewish law by the council at Yavne and the Yochanan ben Zakkai. The same is true with the councils of Nicaea and the synods that were held in Hippo. Because Nicaea affirmed or authorized something, did not mean that those beliefs were not already held <clears throat> as, as true before that council. One way to understand it is this. We have what we call the authorized version, the King James Version. There was nothing in the King James Version that was not already existing in the writings of John Wycliffe, of William Tyndale, the work of Coverdale, etc. He simply, King James simply, with a political motive, authorized it. He was trying to stop a fragmentation between England and Scotland. He was the son of Mary, Queen of Scots. He was trying to stop a fragmentation between the Puritans, that is the nonconformists, and the Church of England. He was trying to hold a dividing political entity together, that is Great Britain, the British Commonwealth, etc. He was trying to hold it together. And he saw religion as necessary to do that. Part of the fragmentation and the cause of the fragmentation was religious. Hence, King James authorized something that had already been held. Yes, they came together, these 50 and 50 scholars he put together to arrive at and to devise the King James Version or the authorized version, but they didn't do anything new. Those things had already existed. He simply authorized what had been new. Well, that is exactly the same thing Constantine did in Nicaea for much the same reason. He had a political motive for doing it. He had to maintain an ecclesiastical unity in order to maintain a political unity. King James was the same. The whole issue between what would become the English Civil War with the Puritans uh, you know, the, and, and the Cavaliers who were loyal to the state church, that is the Church of England, and the whole issue of England versus Scotland. Again, he had a political agenda. King James had a political agenda for maintaining ecclesiastical unity as a way to 
maintain political unity, same as Constantine, same idea. So we have to understand that much the same as what happened with the King James, those texts were already there. They were simply redacted. So too, what happened in Nicaea, those texts were already there. Those texts were already there in both the Latin and, and, and the Eastern traditions. These things already existed in both the East and Western halves of the Roman Empire. Such is it. Thank you so much for your question. My name is Jacob Prash. God bless. Thank you.